Welcome to our webinar organized by Kurraz, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to boost multiple literacy skills and the quality of education in the Horn of Africa in collaboration with ETO Canadian Network for Advocacy and Support. Ladies and gentlemen, we have two decorated and esteemed guests today to discuss, elucidate, and provide a comprehensive context to the current crisis in Ethiopia, the response by the US government and, and the international community, the role of regional and global players. Our two guests are Dr. Anne Fitzgerald, who is the director of Balsley School of International Affairs and a professor at Wilfrid Laurie University's Political Science Department. And Mr. Elias Wendumu, who is the founding director of Sahai Publishers and the editorial director of the International Journal of Ethiopian Studies. The moderators are Dr. Fusaha Yaakov and Mr. Petros Dejani. Today, our session is divided into four segments. One, Ethiopia's current affairs, ongoing issues, challenges and opportunities. Two, regional peace and security of the Horn of Africa. Three, US's foreign policy towards Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa. And four, moving forward, what needs to be done for lasting and sustainable peace and stability. And now, without further ado, we'll move on to our opening question. As you know, uh, TPLF, or the Designated Terrorist Organization, has committed one of the worst treasonous acts against the Ethiopian National Defense Force, massacring more than 6,000 men and women in uniform in a very deplorable manner. Uh, and this question is probably directed to you as well as Elias. From counterinsurgency perspectives, uh, how would have the Ethiopian government acted differently, for that matter, any other nation? The government had to act. Any government would have done the same thing. Go government must restore the legitimacy of the state, maintain the legitimacy, and if that falters, it must act to restore the legitimacy of the state. This is a government's fundamental uh, commitment to its people. Uh, it must protect, defend, promote, and pursue the national interests. And the national interests include uh, the security of the population, the security of the borders, and the sovereignty of the state. There are other national interests like economic prosperity, et cetera, but these were the fundamental interests here. Um, so without even going into details about the incident and what happened, if that sort of uh, incident happened anywhere across the world, in the Western world, you would have seen an instant response. The incident that happened in Tigray uh, by uh, every means, um, uh, what the DPLF has done is uh, treasonous. Uh, it has happened in the past in uh, American history. The Abraham Lincoln uh, incident is very similar and it has been uh, said many times. So uh, I think uh, the audience remembers what happened and how the American government responded to it. And the result uh, was that it really, even though that Abraham Lincoln solved uh, the, the unity uh, and the integrity of the nation, uh, but still America is suffering from that debacle. Uh, and, and there will be uh, consequences within Ethiopia that we have, as Ethiopians, um, we have to deal with it. Uh, we didn't really got time to um, post TPLF arena. We didn't have enough, we didn't make enough time. We didn't have enough time uh, to uh, settle scores or even to, to, there were documentaries coming from different corners of the country where paralyzed personalities, tortured people. The stories were gruesome and very sad. Even within the Tigray, imagine TPLF stayed for 27 years in Ethiopia. And we know what they are capable of. We know what they have done. We know how they use the, the security apparatus and the military apparatus uh, to terrorize and divide and impose themselves into that arena. You, then, then take that 27 experience and reduce it to a region of Tigray. 
And these are the most skilled trained personalities in torture and in, in um, uh, spies and all kinds of uh, 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 trainings. And those people still went to Tigray and uh, literally uh, reigned into them. And for so uh, when I was in, in Tigray, one thing that I noticed was that on the TV, it doesn't matter uh, which time it was, but the majority of the shows that were coming on on their uh, Tigrinya television was that uh, the this the uh, the Derg the TPLFs war with the Derg was always drilled into uh, the public. I didn't understand what that was, but I think it was really creating a generation of, that is really angry or uh, the, the, the generation that feels betrayed by the Ethiopian system. Uh, and they created a generation or reinforced whatever was left there. But at the same time, there was another uh, side of the TPLF uh, um, uh, uh, three years period that we see is that there were people within the TPLF ranks who, who were um, coming out and tell, telling us stories of discontent within. Actually, there were uh, some people who were in the echelon of power in the TPLF uh, system that they were telling us that literally the TPLF itself was hijacked by a certain group. And some even claim that that group came from Adwa, uh, the uh, Sabahat Negga cliques and the Malazanawi cliques. And so we have been hearing all that. So Ethiopia, especially Tigray people, didn't get enough time to exercise this um, uh, this this party that encroached upon them for more than almost sixty years, fifty years. Uh, and what has the, the, the consequence of that is that uh, with the with the start of uh, uh, conflict with the national government and especially attacking those who were protecting and serving it and really created a rift. And to exacerbate that, what has followed through was that the, the sneak attack that was um, literally bulldozing the, 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 the airport in Aksum and then uh, just attacking the security force that was protecting it. And then the response was actually is gruesome as we have learned now. And uh, in any battle scenarios, this is, uh, one thing that I think I, I should say is that uh, I highly, I, I deeply, deeply uh, saddened and sympathize with the people of Tigray who are suffering because of this war. And so all this is the concoction that the TPLF had this idea that they are going to win the national government or create the chaos that ensues the, in, the, in the national arena. And when you combine all this, that it created where we are. But at the same time, uh, the CU Mesfin or many of their, uh, the TPLF officials were coming out and saying things uh, that came to be very interestingly indicative of the communication they were having or the support they were being promised. And then you can see that in the current media, maybe later on we'll cover that. But the TPLF, the, the scenario that we see in Tigray and the past three years, what they were able to focus on, what they were able to use and how they were able to uh, uh, inculcate this new um, um, uh, narrative they created uh, is I think the result of um, uh, our inability to have a, a a time to breathe and focus on ourselves because of all these time bombs where we were exploding around the country. My follow-up question to both of you is whether Ethiopia is carrying out its uh, justified military operation within the confines of uh, humanitarian and human rights norms as much as realistically possible. Uh, I mean, in, in addition to the International Human Rights Organization and uh, international media, which uh, many Ethiopians believe have fallen pre prey to TPLF's propaganda, the Ethiopian Attorney General and the Ethiopian Human Rights Commissions have uh, produced a number of uh, statements and reports that clearly establish uh, very disturbing human rights uh, violations that include door-to-door -door killings and sexual assault and so on by both the Eritrean and Ethiopian troops. Of course, uh, in order to get a full picture of what happened, we will have to wait for uh, independent investigations to complete. But we should still ask, has 
uh, the Ethiopian government done enough to protect innocent civilians from uh, being victimized this way? And uh, in terms of accountability and trans uh, transparency, how do you see the fact that the government's position have evolved from denial in the beginning to admission and then to agreeing to, to, to take action? Doesn't this evolution itself justify some of the international pressure on the government to do more to protect civilians? Yes, a military operation of this sort would normally be justified under the um, uh, current legislation in Ethiopia. Uh, a law enforcement, there's something called military aid to the civil authorities or middle aid to the civil powers, either MACP or MACA. It's a NATO standard uh, across Western countries as well. And it certainly exists uh, across most African countries I've worked in. And that is the process by which the federal forces are called up uh, if, if the need is there. So there, there is grounds for that. On paper, the law enforcement operation is constitutional, legitimate. Um, uh, it, extremely difficult circumstances for a federal armed forces to see their brothers and sisters um, killed in a very brutal, cold-blooded way, and then to have to regroup and and uh, go and participate in a law enforcement operation with very, very um, limited rules of engagement, uh, because law enforcement operations come with limited rules of engagement. And um, of course, in all an armed forces does, standards of um, international law and international humanitarian law and the, the, the law of armed conflict and human rights law and principles and norms, all of that needs to be upheld and demonstrated. Um, and again, I'll repeat what I said in my introductory comments. We, we don't know because we weren't there, right? And I think uh, there has to be more admissions of this. Um, we have a, a, a very confused picture, uh, something that no Venn diagram, uh, however complex, can analyze easily, where you have um, different types of forces, um, uh, some illicit forces, some that allegedly uh, have been given uniforms. You have people who are missing, you have criminals who are missing uh, with all the prisons having been emptied, uh, many people unaccounted for, uh, many uniforms unaccounted for, um, uh, three different groups that we know of, of warring factions, and um, hopefully investigations that will come up with some answers. I think the truth is very important to establish. You know, there's lots of leaders that we don't like in history. There's lots of parts of history that we don't like, but it's our history. And national history is exceedingly important and needs to be based on the truth to be recorded properly in the future. Um, I don't think, and this is my personal view, but I've been involved in um, peace talk, mediation and facilitation. I don't think people can move forward unless they know the truth. And I don't think people can make meaningful apologies and reconcile differences unless the facts are established. So whatever it will take to establish these facts, I don't think only an independent investigation will do that, uh, especially led by an external organization. I think there has to be some coming together of something acceptable to produce answers that are acceptable to the Ethiopian people as well as the international community. You know, there are some very complex social systems in the country that have been built over the years, that have been built around certain political ideologies, um, uh, political models, um, governance models, and those are very intricate. And nobody parachuting into the country can understand that easily unless they've been there for about 20 years at least. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots of dynamics, interfederal dynamics, 
um, ethnic dynamics that play major roles. So we, we had a joint investigation going on. In fact, we had a number of investigations going on, but I noticed that the G7 statement leaves reference to the Ethiopian Rights uh, Human Rights Commission out and just talks about reference to an independent process. And I disagree with that. I, my view is that there needs to be something joint. You know, this is what happened in Northern Ireland um, uh, to support the peace process. It was a very successful outcome. It was done in a very face-saving way, um, which didn't involve big, big daily public statements on arms decommissioning. And, and that sort of left people with dignity, people who had participated in the IRA's activities, people who had committed crimes, but were not, were, were, were decent people, generally decent people who weren't predisposed to violence, but who found themselves caught up in certain circumstances uh, and put under duress in some cases and undue pressure. And the system was to bring in an independent in the form of a former military chief um, a Canadian military chief, actually, with a Finnish uh, member of the team and an American member of the team. It formed a commission. It worked with religious leaders in Northern Ireland um, and the, the, the Northern Ireland government. And um, a peace dividend came about. But, you know, we have good models around the world that reflect outside of the box thinking. Um, and I think we need to explore them a little bit more. Um, I guess the last thing that I would say is, um, yeah, strategic communications have been a real issue, I think. And it goes without saying that the, the Ethiopian government has, has failed on strategic communications um, for whatever reasons. I mean, this was uh, a, a surprise, uh, it caught people off guard, it, but it should have been prioritized at the very earliest stages. Um, because once another entity fills that narrative space, it shapes and influences an international position. And it's very difficult for those international positions to shift back or change. And some of the platforms have been so high, uh, not even high in a pejorative way, but uh, um, absolute, that it's very difficult for them to shift now. Uh, irrespective of the evidence that gets put back into that narrative. So the Ethiopian government has, I think, to, a big job in winning um, old friends and old allies back again. Those strategic communications that are constant, that are, that are very candid and very open and very inviting and two-way have to be restored as quickly as possible. And did uh, a wonderful uh, uh, job in expl explaining this. Uh, and to, to uh, piggyback a little bit in what she said, it's very, very, very important for uh, this information uh, to, for them to be as clear as possible. Uh, it was not for many, uh, many months. And uh, as you said that, uh, from uh, denying to the current state we are in, we have had several um, milestones to it. Um, we have to admit that. And I think as, as Ethiopians, especially when we communicate with our brothers and sisters from the Tigray region, we have to start by understanding what we didn't know before uh, have really created a rift between us. And I think that is very important to solve that, that issue, that, that, that communication issue has to be solved. Then, then we have to see what can be done and what should be done in the, in the coming um, uh, months. Because uh, my fear is that the, the, the conflict in Tigray is used for a larger goal. And that is what scares the heck out of me. The reason I'm saying this is that um, the, during the Second World War, when uh, before the Second World War, when Italy uh, tried to invade Ethiopia, what they used was the slavery, that Ethiopia is a slave trading country and it's selling its people. And that was what really um, uh, dominated the, the, the West, especially coming from uh, the Italian side. Uh, and 
but at the same time, the, the, the entire, their whole ambition was just to, two, for two things. One is to avenge uh, 40 years, what they lost in 40 years ago, the Adwa War. But at the same time, the other major force was that the, the French and the, the British supporting them to go and leave their alliance with, from, uh, from the Germans, from Hitler, and then so that they can divide them. Uh, and that was the, in the background, that was what was cooking. But for that narrative, what they used was the, the, um, um, the, the Slev narrative was highly uh, 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 publicized in the, in the West and people were really upset about this. And the other story that was uh, highly publicized during that, that media um, attack against Ethiopia was uh, that Ethiopians hate white people and they discriminate against them in the country. And even actually, uh, Parochaska's book, uh, he's a lawyer, so he makes arguments by giving different scenarios in which that, you know, white people were attacked or was mistreated in the workplace or in their um, uh, community where they lived in. Those were the kind of narratives that were given at that time. And the parallel that we see today is that the media coverage in America, uh, I have been a media advocate for the last 20, I mean, 30 years in the first uh, 27 years uh, uh, in this country. One of the things that we have, I mean, there are many people died, 200. I'm not comparing this with our brothers and sisters, what's happening in, the, in, the, in Tigray now. I'm talking about what happened in mid 90s and uh, early 2000, uh, uh, 2020, 20, 2000. Uh, specifically, I can uh, give you an example for what has happened in uh, 2005, uh, post-election violence in Ethiopia. And about 200 people were killed, massacred, and most of them were hit on their head or in torso. And there were videos that um, you can see. There was it was not light to it was not covered. This was you can see on screens the torture. You can see the dead bodies in the streets. The world was watching. But in since the 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 post election violence for, for the foreseeable eight month, we did a research. In that research, we found only twenty articles from the. Uh, 20 articles from the New York Times, which talked about it. Uh, Washington, uh, uh, the Washington Post had 28 articles. Uh, the Wall Street Journal had only four articles. The Los Angeles Times had only nine articles. This is eight months period. When you tabulate the numbers, if you see the words count for each reporting, it was just laughable. It's just a mere 300 words. And, and what was going on? Really, what has happened? And at the same time, when you cover, when you go back and see what happened, how the news was reported in Egypt for one month, for one month, New York Times had 151, Washington Post had 144. Imagine, compare it to the 28th article that was published in, for Ethiopia. And uh, um, Wall Street Journal had 103, and Los Angeles Times had 92. Um, comparing that with nine articles for eight months. I mean, this is... The comparison is staggering. So what is happening? I mean, that's a very important question that we need to start to ask. Why, this is important. Tigray is Ethio in Ethiopia. Tigray is Ethiopia. Tigrayans are our citizens. What a, a single or one person should not be, should not die without, it's, I mean, all these horrifying stories we hear of rep and looting, it's, abhorrent to say the least. That is something that the Ethiopian government should answer and will answer in the future. And it will be in our history books, we like it or not. But what happened? Why are those things happened? But at the same time, you go back and see what was happening in Ethiopia within the other regions in Ethiopia, the Amara, the Amara region, the Oromia region, the Ben Shangul region, the number of people who are being killed, brutalized, and um, uh, cut into pieces in a way that is as gruesome as you can think. These are individuals that none of this media, the American media that I'm talking about mentioned, let alone wrote extensively about. So what are they trying to do? Are they dividing us within? I think that is where uh, I, I, I see the, the, the problem. And so to what end are they doing this? 
And I think that's the most important question that I want to ask today. What is happening? So the, the, the most, if we, let's go back around, you know, just a few years back and see the, the Kuwait uh, uh, and the Saddam Hussein, uh, the Iraqi war, um, the, I think it must be 91, 90, uh, uh, when, what was the justification of the war? The stories that they were told, and I think it's a Canadian publication journalist who, who investigated and said that there was no single ammunition in the, uh, in the, Kuwait, in the Iraqi side that was uh, given to uh, the, the Kuwaiti who, who invited America to, to help them. Uh, and because they were scared and they were in, uh, in uh, what do you call it, um, they were going to be invaded, overtaken by the Iraqi. So they created so many things. One of the things that they created was the ambassador's daughter came out and cried on, on, uh, 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 in the hearing, talking about the, the kids who are being taken out of the, uh, the incubator and dying. And I, I, even when I see it today, uh, I tear up because it's emotional, it's a powerful story. But was, was it true? It was not. To, to what end with, with America did that? Because they wanted to create a, a, a military base in Kuwait. So we have had these historical moments. We go back and see it. And so uh, what is happening today is, I think it's a precursor to something get greater, something bigger. So what is happening in Ethiopia, in Tigray region specifically now is is bigger than the skirmish that is, or the, 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 the brutality that is happening in Tigray. Uh, and so I want us to see it in that, in, that, in that way. This is actually, you know, people try to undermine what is being transpired there. And, they, and I sometimes feel that they, they lose sight from the magnitude of what it could have been, had it not been for the intervention. So having talked about the brutalization our hurt, you know, goes out for our brothers and sisters, every place that are suffering. And we need to heal. We need to heal to transform. So for these generations, we have been enduring this cycle of violence. Somehow, somewhere, we need to break that. But having said this, when talk, talking about that narrative, I'm, I'm so glad you, you mentioned, I'm gonna come back to you with, 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 the, with some of the, within the, within the colonial discourse, it's not only uh, what matters, it's not only what is being publicized. It's also what is being missing, what's being deleted is so critical. So for that article, for that, that media bombardment, uh, there are key elements that are being missing for, 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 for the longest period of time. For instance, 27 years TPLF's tyranny, uh, atrocities, genocide, and human rights violation, embezzlement of billions of eight dollars is not mentioned on the, the main, main, main discourse. The second thing is also the attack itself. That brutalization, that uh, for me, that treasonous act is one of its kind in human history for people who have been protecting me for 20 plus years and the way things have transpired, it is, as you say, it's our history. We have, to, we have to just heal from it somehow. So that you don't see that being reported. The other thing is also the Micarta genocide uh, and, and the genocide that Amhara people have been enduring, the Somali massacre the Gambela Anyar, we can go on and on for the last 30 plus years. By the way, more than Tigrayan people, nobody has ever endured that kind of brutality for 40 plus years. So we need to also understand that. People need to differentiate between the TPLF, uh, you know, the, the power, you know, grabbers versus the people. The people are the most oppressed people in, in, fa in fact. Other places you can at least scream, you can just let that out. So and at the same time, also we need to also be mindful of that Missiles have been launched to Eritrea, the capital city of you know, Asmera and whatnot, and also Gondor, and, and all these things have been missing from the discourse. So having taken into consideration, uh, why do you think this is being omitted? Elias, I'm gonna come back to you. Coming back to the, the, the ghost of Adwa, you already mentioned that, and I want you to talk about African brothers and sisters in general to talk about their own history. What's the implication of that? Again, you also talked about that Sahai daily briefings that the word counts and whatnot. What are the significance? What are, what are some of the lessons you have gained throughout this? And in just, you know, I know it's a lot of loaded question and just take a stab at it, please. When, when we go, for example, when we're during the, the Libyan uh, 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 problem a few years back, uh, we have seen the stories how um, 
uh, Muhammad Gaddafi is killing his own people and how he's brutalizing them. The news were just out there, he just bombarded. Um, and so there were many uh, opposition groups that were funded, uh, you know, armed uh, by the, the uh, French government and the, by the American government. Uh, and the outcome that we have seen is did it save the people of Libya? Uh, did they uh, really alleviate the human suffering that uh, we were propagated, uh, we, were, we were told about? Um, this doesn't uh, end up in that kind of vein. We shouldn't go the same route. Uh, and what is being told about Ethiopia since the, the, the war began, we have been uh, um, trying to follow what's happening in the world, what the news media internationally has been saying about or uh, reporting on Ethiopia specifically, uh, and especially about the, the war or anything related to uh, Ethiopia and strategic uh, alignments. And we cover um, every continent, the news that comes out of every continent. And one thing that we have noticed is that almost every man, month without failing, uh, uh, the Washington Post, the New York Times, um, Financial Times, uh, the, uh, the Wall Street Journal, uh, the BBC sometimes, the VO, even the VOA, and uh, they publish uh, almost subsequently, uh, or sometimes the two publications uh, do similar kind of uh, editorial on Ethiopia. Yeah, this is unprecedented. We have never seen anything like it. The only time similar kind of news reporting on Ethiopia happened was during the revolution, uh, the first three years of the revolution. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so what is happening? Are we really in the midst of uh, the, the Cold War uh, where Ethiopia is pushed back into the other side? Uh, is this a, a proxy war that have started that we didn't really sign on to? Uh, or that we are not really um, uh, seeing it. And at the same time, the other conflict, this is the sad thing about all this is that uh, people uh, who are misled and um, victimized by the TPLF or the government victimized, victim, made them, victimized them and they're trying to protect themselves. And so I think this is not a, a foreign war invading Ethiopia, but our story within is being used by a foreign force to attack us. So I think those are the kind of things that um, uh, we're trying to see. And uh, the the daily news brief that we cover, that we have uh, we have been uh, 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 working on shows you all this. And uh, by the way, this uh, news briefs goes to the media uh, uh, leaders, uh, the uh, business leaders, the government leaders. Uh, in, in people who should, uh, academicians who are studying on, the, on, on similar topics. The point is that I think we have to understand, we have to see what is being told about it, what is being said about us. Uh, and there is this uh, recording that I have um, received recently uh, that Haile Selassie is speaking about what is being said about Ethiopia in, in Europe when he was in exile in England. Uh, and when you hear his voice, the agony that you hear in him, that he's, he's saying that we are not really enslaving our people. Uh, and, but but the, the narrative has changed against him and it was used against Ethiopia. And it was too late to, to, to save Ethiopia by that time. By that time, uh, the, the Italians came in and used uh, master, guard, um, um, master gas and killed so many people. If you're trying to liberate Ethiopia from enslavement, is, that, is this how you attack us so that you can be able to, to do this? And so why, why is that is happening? So I think those are the, 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 the issues that we need to, to, to understand. And that's what we are trying to, our, our fingers are at the pulse trying to understand and follow through the, the, the different narratives in that way that we can be able to predict or to, to, to know what has happened, what is happening the, in the next uh, uh, few months. In the, first, the, the beginning of this uh, news coverage shifted to uh, uh, genocide, uh, uh, the rape issues, and now the famine is really taking over. And when you even see within that, uh, for every single shift and change that, that you see, 
uh, there are personalities surfacing, all, and most of, of these personalities were in the past involved in this, uh, the same kind of uh, engagement in the Cold War, and they are coming back again. You can see that in the uh, Bob Geldof's recent uh, live ed registration, and those are really uh, telling, but at the same time scary. And I think we have to wake up and see for what it is. We're going to move to the the second phase as as you know the regional peace and security, and I'm going to come back to you. Uh, quite often. The Western government and, and you know the, the United States, EU, whatnot, they they within their discourse discourse they talk about global peace and security. They support poverty alleviation, all these things. Now we've seen um, Ethiopia and Eritrea basically, you know, after 20 years of that no peace, no war, they seem to have you know hashed their challenges and then they're trying to foster that alliance, that regional unity or whatnot. But when you look at this, this doesn't seem to be sitting well with, with, with the Western uh, the powers. And, 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 and also they are doing this, trying to isolate Ethiopia at the international scene, even to the extent that they're trying to uh, kind of disentangle or just kind of remove Ethiopia from uh, African Union to try to turn that. Like, and it's the, there's this cynical policy that has been surfacing now, as, as, as our brother Elias is trying to say, we need to just really wake up and see what are those things. So what do you think, um, what, 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 first of all, why is this a problem for, for, for the unity, integrity, and, and regional peace and security in that area? Why would they see it as a threat? And the second thing is, this, this aggression, this, this uh, hostile way of approaching to the, 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 the region, what would be the ramification down the road? I think the isolation, the efforts to isolate Ethiopia are quite obvious now and um, quite distasteful as well as an oldest um, Cold War African ally. Um, I think that at the regional level, borders are an important issue. And yes, a peace was struck with Eritrea um, the initial phases of that piece uh, was struck, and but I'm not sure if it should be held up as a model peace uh, resolution deal. I mean, ideally, others would have been involved as well, but we're aware of the issues why that did not happen. And ideally, if land had to be handed back, under the original provision of Algiers and as a result of the findings of the Boundary Commission, which then got suspended because of the long stalemate between the two countries, that would have happened in a, in a more ideal way, right? Involving communities, involving um, uh, a ceremonial style passing back, inv involving dialogue with the communities as well to determine how everybody wanted to live uh, in the most flourishing, thriving and harmonious way. Um, but we've also seen the issues that can arise with, um, with, with contested borders between Sudan and Western Amhara as well. So I think at the regional level, uh, some discussions on borders are important. Um, I think also at the regional level, uh, the, the, the GERD issues are, are going to be important going forward. I think that the first, like we're seeing Egypt work, try to work through the U UN Security Council now to try to bypass the African Union. And we've seen some recent evidence of that over the last couple of days. Um, and it, it, it the African Union needs to lead on this. This is an African issue. And just like Africa doesn't need necessarily CNN and BBC, it should, it should have its own media stations actually. And, uh, and, and, and let this be a lesson for how it should expedite the development of capability in that area. So too, um, does the African Union need to be empowered to, to take this issue on? Um, I think we're, you know, we're all of a sudden locating Ethiopian water infrastructure and Nile waters in the Middle East. And uh, we've seen the US in discussions with Saudi, Qatar, UAE on the Nile. We've seen Jeff Feltman in Kenya, discussions on the tensions in Tigray, the Nile waters, 
handing back counterterrorism capability back from Ethiopia to Kenya. We've seen U.S. discussions with South Africa and Nigeria on the Nile. This is a big issue for the U.S. government. Big. And Elias, you couldn't have said it better, um, or I couldn't have said it better, what you said about uh, the issue in Tigray being, in fact, uh, I wrote an article about this with Hugh Siegel um, a couple of months ago, that, that this was about a proxy battle space, um, about a proxy competition over resources with China. And uh, I think the United States and some other allies underestimate that there are, uh, you know, another 105 million people that live outside the region. And if you think what happened in, um, well, Sudan, take Sudan, for instance, um, the policies on sanctions on Sudan have completely de decimated the economy and did very earlier on. And the reason why we saw what we saw in Sudan around the um, ousting of the Omar Bashir government was because food subsidies were lost. Uh, the price of living, the cost of living just went to unaffordable levels that people, you know, a very compliant, historically well-behaved population took to the streets and they lay themselves down in front of the Ministry of Defense uh, because they knew that the, the defense forces would be the only entity in the country that could do something about this. But it was an issue by that time about survivability and change was required. Now, the same issue is not the case for Ethiopia, but can you imagine if the country really rose up and the country is coming together more and more on this? What would the United States think to have a situation like this on their hands that they're responsible for? And, and the question I would have for the Biden administration is, what is your strategic end state? I mean, that's important for any plan, whether it's a personal plan, whether it's an organizational plan. But that is not clear for me. And that's why I've described the approach as one of lacking logic and sense. It needs to be the partner of choice in the Horn of Africa. It, that needs to be based on trusted partnerships. Um, you know, I think there's been media hype around this because it's become very personalized as well. And the whole notion of a Nobel Peace Prize winner having a difficult situation now on his hands. The media has just thrived on that. And it's become very, very personalized towards the prime minister. You know, let's get the ele elephant out of the room. Um, and I think that uh, the bravado and the behavior that we're seeing by people holding political office at the moment, people who are leading NGOs, people who are, um, you know, used to different standards of professional behavior and conduct is for me less than acceptable, especially in civil society. I think it really undermines a lot of the, the principles that our, that our professional existence is, is based on. So, um, yeah, I'll just, I'll leave those remarks on regional issues because I think I covered remarks about the regional potential in my opening uh, statement. To follow up on, uh, on your comment about the uh, lack of logic in foreign policy uh, uh, by U.S. Uh, so does this indicate to you then this is not really a, a coordinated, well-planned effort to isolate Ethiopia, because there could be different interpretations of uh, their foreign policy. So is it rather than just a confluence of many factors leading uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to Ethiopia's current predicament, which importantly includes the success of TPLF's uh, uh, propaganda and efforts and the network that they have been able to establish for years to have uh, some kind of influence in 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 uh, foreign policy, and given the fact that this uh, current uh, isolation of Ethiopia will eventually lead to the weakening and possibly the disintegration of Ethiopia, how would this serve the strategic interest of the West if 
if this is a designed policy, if it is a de designed and coordinated effort. It was coordinated to a certain extent by certain people and certain actors, but I think the international community's approach has not been coordinated and it um, is, is misinformed. Now, let's talk about the importance of evidence here. And uh, Elias mentioned Iraq. And uh, so we saw what happened in the US around Iraq and the evidence was a dodgy thesis, a graduate thesis from an unknown university I think even online university. Uh, and, and that led to a big um, inquiry in the United Kingdom as well. It was called the Butler Commission. Mm -hmm. The results of that um, really transformed the intelligence system in the UK. Um, it it uh, restructured the intelligence community so that it was responsible first and foremost for analysis and churning that analysis and asking sense making questions to that analysis and then crystallizing the analysis and not having anything to do with decision making the decision making was left to the political masters because that's what their job is and that's what they're paid for but the intelligence community would know that you know it it, it focused on its core mandate intelligence and so we're supposed to be long away from these problems now and to base enormous decisions on a very, very light, questionable evidence based and not diverse perspectives that have been investigated by way of forensic capability on the ground, evidence by way of triangulated views, evidence by way of, um, well, I mean, you know, we're all scholars in the room. Um, we, we, we know what sort of methods are used to come up with decent analysis is, is very frightening in my view. And so, uh, you know, I, I see with, with the comments coming out of the summit, almost a suspension has been taken. That's, that's how I interpreted it this morning when I read it. Um, I think, let's hope there's been a bit of a sensible discussion in that room. Some um, voices of reason have said, you know, I think probably we shouldn't rush to, to, to any next level. Others may have been pushing for it, but, um, and, and I'm, I'm probably going off track here of your question, but I, I, I bring it back to evidence-based policy and um, uh, the fact that it shaped a narrative already it has um, informed policy and decision-making already. Uh, I think the best that we can expect now is for that policy and decisions to be suspended and paused until other things happen and we can take a certain uh, other route with it. But as far as the end state is concerned, I feel that it doesn't make sense and it lacks logic because it will further isolate the U.S., from, um, and, and, and let's not forget, Africa stands together, right? Uh, if, 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 if there is, I mean, people long remember what US policy did to Sudan. People long remember what policy has done to Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, we're seeing troops pull back now. We're seeing Taliban hardening their positions across communities. Um, we're seeing what's happened in Somalia as well. Some gains, but some regression as well. And um, there's very good reasons why communities in Somalia still support Shabaab as well, because those critical provisions just haven't been put in place at the center. So, yeah, I think, it, it, you know, there are big risks here, especially when you see China and Russia starting to exert heart and positions on the UN Security Council. And what we don't want is to see this region, this wonderful region of the world become a proxy battleground for a Cold War economic battle. And this is why I use the term resilience a lot, that, that Ethiopians, there, there's no other time in history that the country needs to come together no matter what political preferences, no matter what ethnic or religious backgrounds and be strong together and defend itself against this pressure. 
um, rebuild, reconcile, um, develop meaningful, well-informed policies, use your own civil society to do that, um, to be able to say, actually, that's not going to work for us. You know, we need to broker a different solution here. Um, and I think on, on the Gur Dam, finally, uh, there, there are laws, there are international laws for transboundary water that need to be respected. So not only do the Africans uh, through the African Union need to lead on this without involving Middle East actors and, and the United States. I mean, what, what President Trump brought to the, the GERD discussions um, already derailed it sufficiently. Uh, things need to get back on track. The, the right thing to do in my view is talk about the filling as, as a small group of countries, but anything beyond that on water sharing must involve the rest of the, the Nile riparian states um, and observe transboundary water law, um, international law. So staying with the same uh, topic, I guess, then uh, regarding GERD, uh, Egypt's uh, strategic importance to US is, uh, is obvious. And as you know, uh, Egypt is the second uh, largest non-NATO recipient of US military aid after Israel. And for US to secure Persian Gulf energy resources and to secure the Swiss Canal, which serves both as an important international oil route and a critical route to US weapons. Uh, so US has considered Egypt as a vital ally. So what do you think uh, the implications of this uh, in terms of its policy towards uh, Ethiopia and how should uh, Ethiopia playing this relationship to her advantage in terms of uh, the GERD negotiation? Um, I, I, I think, as we have witnessed in the, during the DERG negotiations, uh, uh, especially in the last uh, few months of uh, Trump, uh, the Ethiopian government um, opened up itself to uh, something uh, I think they regretted it later on, but they opened up so that just to show, I think, their, uh, their uh, long-term relationships with the American government. Uh, and uh, they opened it to, in a way that they, they were, uh, uh, they came as an observer capacity, but at the same time, we have seen what has happened during the negotiation and how um, uh, they forced themselves into uh, actually leaning to the other direction against the state of an interest. Uh, and what this opens up Ethiopia I into uh, a much undesirable results that actually backfired uh, into in, in, in the government. Yes, the American government supports the Egyptian. They have been supporting it for a very long time. And now I think we're seeing similar, uh, uh, the continuation of the billion dollar uh, in military uh, support that they have uh, extended recently shows the same uh, narrative. But again, the water issue in Ethiopia, for me at least, is not about the GERD. The GERD is the issue in which that they are entering into that conversation, but it takes another totally different kind of uh, uh, scenario, which is, I think we can go to the Bolivia water uh, rights issue, which we have seen uh, uh, a few a couple of decades ago. And if we understand what happened during that, uh, that um, uh, the Bolivian struggle to reclaim their water uh, resources, their water resource, their, their rights to, to their water, including the rain, I think that is the only way that we can be able to decipher what is happening in Ethiopia. Uh, because uh, look what has happened. Uh, it was 20, October 21st that uh, Trump came out and said that uh, Egypt, uh, because Ethiopia was not willing to uh, sign the agreement that uh, America proposed. And then the, the, Ethiopia, the, the American prime president who is sitting in office uh, said that the Egyptian uh, may or will um, uh, demolish, uh, attack the, the, the dam. And that is unprecedented. We have never had that kind of statement to come. We don't expect from a friendly government to come such kind of uh, admonition against a nation state and uh, something that belongs within the, the, the boundary. But what happened since then shows you that uh, 
maybe I think it was about uh, maybe a month later that uh, the TPLF or even less than that, the TPLF attacked the military. And all those things that, that transpired since shows you that the interest is not was not the GERD. It's actually much larger. It's a regional issue that's happening. Uh, and the current uh, uh, configuration of things, for example, the um, uh, if you're thinking, we're thinking about the GERD, but not only that, but even to a level where Sudan claims the entire region, not the not the the dam, but the entire region of uh, uh, Gambela Gumu's region. Uh, so all those things shows you that what is happening with the earlier, what uh, uh, Anne said earlier about the national and the regional shifts that are being created in the Horn is not about Ethiopia, not about the GERD, it's actually larger. Uh, and so if we understand that, if we accept that, then we can be able to articulate or understand or, or even start to engage in the same similar manner and we will be in the same playing field. The USIP report uh, that came out a uh, uh, few months before uh, the war, a month before the war, uh, articulates these issues that the changing you know, geopolitical dynamic into the, the Red Sea uh, uh, arena. And which was, I think the first time that they used the name, uh, the Red Sea arena was in uh, uh, April, but at the same time, the new report, the full report came out in uh, 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 October uh, 21st, I believe. I'm quoting uh, the November 5th, uh, the United States Institute of Peace uh, report that says that uh, the United States, including uh, uh, Congress, uh, uh, should make that any change by fourth or fiat either to the Ethiopian constitution order or to its internal or external borders will not be uh, recognized. And the same kind of, you know, we're talking about the, uh, the the border. This is you know, but at the same time, the Nile issue changed into the border issue, and then the border issue changed into a humanitarian crisis issue, and the humanitarian crisis issue involved uh, the NATO, involved the EU, involved now uh, the G7, and so it's it's bigger than the 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 GERD, uh, the dam issue. That's what I'm trying to say. Can I just step in on on? Thanks on that one, because I think the the lead up of events is important as well uh, in terms of this. Um, I think it was five days into the conflict, Sudan had effectively encased Ethiopian territory. Um, five days later, there was a very sophisticated joint military exercise between Egypt and Sudan. Now, I've, I've been involved in, in helping with the organization as an academic with, with military organ, um, exercises in the UK, and, and these don't get organized overnight. Mm -hmm. um, you then had a military pact uh, agreed between the two countries. And I, you know, here is another area that I think the US could have played a role based on its, its close uh, relationship with Egypt, because it meant that if the Al-Fashka problem or the, the rebel incursions further south into Beneshengul, um, if that had been sufficiently provocative to, um, and arguably it, it, it was, but uh, it put Ethiopia in a very, very difficult position about responding to that because it would have been a response generated by two countries, not just Sudan, because of the military pact. So, you know, you could argue that the U.S. is indirectly supporting rebel incursions across the border. It's, it's also going against the national interests of the Sudanese people. Uh, the Sudan water minister openly acknowledged in January of 2020 that they have not been using even a third of their legal allocation of the Nile waters. And that with um, the rest of that 18 billion cubic meters allocation, it would have three times as much water for irrigation purposes, let alone for flood defenses, et cetera. So that's important for agricultural development. And so this is denying the Sudanese people uh, of, 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 of food security. 
Um, and then I guess the final thing to say is that Sudan and Ethiopia have had a decent relationship for a long time. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an alliance that has very few problems. I've had the pleasure and privilege of working in, in uh, Sudan for the last 15 years, almost as long as I've worked in Ethiopia for. But, you know, they're meddling with this alliance as well, this historically strong alliance. Um, so back to your original question, by, by, by putting Egypt at the helm of these interests and uh, not being well informed about the potential backlashes and side effects of these actions, it's, it's, you can argue it's playing a, a, a dangerous game. And I would say to, um, to the Ethiopian government that we all, what we all learned in school was nice guys finish last. You know, and uh, we all remember when Mela Zanawe in the early, just following the turn of the millennium after the Somali, um, with the Islamic court um, uh, uh, armed insurgents made efforts to cross into Ethiopian territory, troops were deployed into Somalia. And I remember the international community went, oh, I was teaching in Ethiopia at the time and I had a bunch of guest speakers booked to come in and everybody said, no, we can't do that because the Ethiopian government has sent uh, troops into Somalia. But the prime minister at the time, Melis and always stood up and said, this was firmly in our national interest. We did this because of X, Y, Z, and we stand by our decision. And then everybody sort of stood back and said, okay. And business as usual resumed in Addis. And I'm not saying who was right and who was wrong, but but being firm, being uh, uh, not 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 putting yourself in a position to be trampled on at all. And I, I say this with reference to the GERD negotiations. Um, nice guys finish last. Let me add uh, something uh, to this one. Uh, as um, uh, Anne said, um, uh, Sudan reported that they took uh, the Al Fashka region uh, on December the third. Uh, and, uh, and they report, and uh, they, that's what they reported. And but at the same time, on uh, uh, on uh, November 14th, I think that must be the week that the Ethiopian government announced that they completed uh, the uh, taking over the Makale and uh, winning the war. Uh, at that day, I think for, on November 14th, uh, the foreign policy uh, published uh, an article that said uh, Sudan will decide the outcome of the Ethiopian civil war. Um, and in it, um, uh, let me quote uh, how it reads. Uh, it says that uh, without Sudan, it seems that the TPLF's only remaining hope would be to overthrow Abiy's government or seek to assassinate him with the support of his many other enemies. Okay, um, this is what I wanted to uh, point out here. If you go to the foreign policy website today, you are not going to see this text. It's altered, it's doctored. And every, as a journalist, as a former journalist, one thing that you do, especially at this time, is that every time you revise an article, you, not only that you, claim what you what you write what you revised but also you write when you uh, revised it you, you you write the time the date and time of the revision the version you do that in every main websites if you go to even in foreign policy you can go and find those but today how it stands on the foreign policy website is that this is what it says it says without sudan a concerned tplf which is no stranger to ruthless and violent tactics might attempt to overthrow Abiy's government or seek to assassinate him with the support of his many uh, other enemies. Might attempt to overthrow, that's what it says. The, only, the previous one is that it's TPLF's only remaining hope would be to overthrow or assassinate him. So the battle that is happening in the ground is not happening within the TPLF uh, remaining or the, T the Tigray people or the Ethiopian government or the Ethiopian people. That's not what's happening. It's actually beyond, beyond our control and beyond uh, it's bigger. That's why I try to reference to the point that, um, uh, that uh, just, you know, the editorial statements that are coming against uh, the Ethiopian government or what the Ethiopian government is doing in the ground 
within its borders uh, is uh, has a, it just uh, screams to for our attention to see that something what's happening is beyond Ethiopia and greater uh, than uh, the current debacle. Thank you. I'm so glad you just kind of put those things together, and also you answered my question about the Bolivia. I actually looked at it's a water grabbing, and also if you remember, I would have shown you the video, but because of the technical difficulties about the the speech by the VP, Kamala Harris, about the water, how water became a precious commodity that war is going to be about that. So having said, having looked at this perspective, we now let's jump into the foreign, uh, the US's hostile foreign policy with respect to the Ethiopia. But when you look at through, you know, that hidden lines, you identify those things. For example, this, it's continued to undermine the foreign policy continue to undermine uh, the sovereignty of African and, and, and African nation, particularly in Ethiopia, and particularly following, you know, uh, the this like in 1976, Ethiopia basically became the proxy between uh, the Russia and, 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 and in the United States. Fast forward, how many years now? Uh, 2021, the same, uh, Ethiopia again find itself the tension between America and China. Uh, we, we're, we're talking about those larger, bigger, you know, you know pieces. So, Continuously, Secretary Blinken is basically finger pointing. You know what his rhetoric is. He's been accusatory. It's only sanction, sanctionist approach to just, you know, Amhara militia, Ethiopia, Eritrea government, do this, you know, this kind of ultimatum. So those things are really becoming very belligerent in their act. By the way, um, he voted for the invasion of Iraq. He also voted for the bombardment of uh, Yemen by the Saudi Arabia and also the breakdown of Libya. So where does this end? Do you think ultimately NATO, we, we see, we end up seeing NATO birds around Ethiopia because Ethiopians are saying, you know, that's like a while ago, as you talked about, like Melis, Abi is probably saying, no, 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 you're not gonna have a puppet leader in here. So those kind of things, where do you think would end up? What scares me the most currently is 